I want to continue the thought on learning to love. You know, the Bible tells us so many things about love. As I thought about that in preparation for the services this morning and tonight, I, I'm reminded that love is a pressing attribute of every child of God. It's, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, you have love one for another. The fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one out of the box? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Of all the things that God says, I don't think God says he's peace. But he does say God is love. He's love. And those of us who are children of God and representatives of God, that is one thing that this world cannot deny. It's the only badge of discipleship this world recognizes is if God's people love. Love God and love others. That's the whole duty of man primarily. If you look at the whole Bible, you said you need to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And yet, it's a challenge for each of us. Many of us are not sure what even love is. We think it's a fuzzy-wuzzy or a feeling, but it's not. Love is a decision, but it needs to be birthed in a spirit-filled life. We've talked about that this morning. I'll not spend a lot of time on it. It's why that I'm easily offended sometimes. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. That means to make them fall or stumble or to be held up on something. Love is a needed attribute. My love for God, my love for the word of God makes me very tough on the inner man. The Bible tells us lots of things. I'm amazed how that love is giving. You cannot, uh, you can give and not love, but you cannot love and not give. And so much of learning to love people is understanding how much God loves me and how much God loves you. Remember years ago, going to a hospital room and a man was living in sin. He was in rebellion to God, but he, he was happy that I came and saw him. And I came and saw him in the hospital room. We talked for a few minutes. I said, I said, friend, do you know that God loves you? He said, well, I'm sure he loves me a little bit but not like he loves everybody else. You know, I think one of the reasons he did not live for the Lord, did not trust the Lord, he wasn't sure that he loved him. And that's, of course, Satan's tactic, a tactic, if you would. He wants to make you think that you're not important to God and don't trust the Lord. Just like the first time he opened his mouth in the Bible against Eve, yea, hath God said, you don't believe God, do you? You're not going to die, denied the word of God, cast doubt upon the word of God, cast doubt upon his character when God tells us he's love. Jeremiah 31, verse number uh, 2, I think. In verse 3, it says, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. With loving kindness have I drawn thee. Well, God loves me, and, and really we love him because he... But if you have a struggle with, if you've bought into believing that God doesn't really care about you, then you're going to have a hard time loving him. They have a large time, hard time forgiving others. You're going to have a hard time obeying him. God uses the test of our obedience. He uses the, the uh, thermometer of obedience to test the temperature of our love. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The love is a major theme of the Bible, and yet it's real challenging. God tells husbands, love your wife. Tells in Titus, wives, love your husbands and children. And yet these are challenges that happen inside of a, a believer especially. And it's sad because all of us who are saved, we have been forgiven by God. He has proven his love to us. No longer is eternal life a mystery, and yet we sometimes struggle to love him and to love others as we should. And with that background, this morning I spoke to you a little bit about the acrostic of love. I'd like to share with you a few things. I think because of time, I will struggle to get through all, through all four of them, but I want to start with L again. And if I love, love, how do I learn to love? I'm going to give you a couple thoughts. Number one, love listens. Love listens to the Holy Spirit and obeys Him. One of the best fast tracks to get to a life of love is to be responsive to the Holy Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit is God. He lives inside of you. And if God is love, He can show you how to love. I've been amazed at watching love uh, people love God and love others. I, I don't think I'm, I'm where I need to be on that area. I know I'm not. 
At times I feel so embarrassed by my selfishness and how I look at things and look at people and circumstances. But I tell you, when I, a few good days in my life and I've been submitted to the Holy Spirit of God, God has taught me to love. Years ago, I remember hearing this statement, love is not feeling right about someone. You know, some people think you've got to love someone, you've got to feel right about them. No. Love is not feeling right about someone. It's making a decision to treat that someone right. It's not feeling right. It's doing right. That's why the Bible says, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. A lot of things God asks me to do, I'm not really interested. I'm not interested at all. It looks like work to me. It looks like it goes against my grain. But love is not feeling right about someone, but deciding to treat someone right. Number one, I think the best way to do that is to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit and obey Him. Now, I think the Holy Spirit is a lot louder than we give Him credit for. Sometimes He, obvious ways, tells us to do this. I remember years ago, the Lord impressed my heart about a man that I was praying for for salvation. And uh, I thought about him. I remember driving. I was driving on 27th Street in, in uh, Long Beach, California, going between Magnolia and Pacific Avenue. And the Lord impressed my heart to pray for him. So I prayed for him. I really, I remember right where I was, and I said, Dear Lord, I pray you please bring him to the Lord and help him. And it seemed like the Spirit of God said, I, don't want, I want you to do more than pray for him. I want you to text him or call him. I thought, well, okay, he's probably at work, but I'll try. I'll leave a message for him. I called him, and, he's, and uh, to my surprise, he answered. He said, hey, this is Pastor? I said, yes, yeah, Pastor, how are you doing? He goes, how did you know? Said, how to know what? He said, we're in the emergency room. Something's wrong with my daughter, real bad wrong with my daughter. I said, what emergency room are you in? He said, I'm in Long Beach Memorial Hospital. I said, I'm, I'm about five blocks away. I'll be there in just a moment. I walked into that emergency room, and he said, wow, who told you? School call years. Who, I don't even know who would know. Who told you we're here? I said, no one. You did. He said, well, how, how did you know, Pastor? I said, I, I, I know you may not understand this, but I think the Holy Spirit knows. And he impressed my heart to call you. I, didn't, I don't know why I don't call you all the time, do I? He says, no, you don't call me all the time. But he said, how did you know that Annabelle's in the hospital and she's so sick? I didn't know that, but I just came that time. You know, I think how many times we've, we oftentimes ignore that prompting. God tells us, pray for that person. Call them, text them, go see them. And we oftentimes do not listen to the Holy Spirit of God. I have a practice I oftentimes use in my house. I don't always do it. But uh, I, years ago, I, I started thinking, you know, sometimes I'm walking to my house and I have just... Uh, I haven't carried the burdens of the world, but I, I have been talking to people since I got up in the morning, going through multiple texts, multiple emails, multiple conversations and phone calls, and now I'm getting ready to walk under the eve of my home to meet someone that I love very much and Linda and kids that I love very much. I can't remember all their names, but I know who they are. And they don't really care who I've counseled or what message I have preached or what people I've done. They need a dad and they need a husband. So for years I, I have tried occasionally and, and try to do it regularly. But before I grab the doorknob or take the doorknob of our home, I just stop for a second. Now when it's 20 below, I don't stop at all. I just get right in there. <laughs> but on normal days, I just stop for a second. And I say, dear Holy Spirit, whatever I need to be, whatever Linda needs me to be, whatever the kids need me to be, help me to be sensitive to your spirit. I think many times that's been a game changer in the Wilkerson house. Not because of me, but because of him. He lives inside of us, and I think we have a greater capacity to love him when he has more of me. You know, when you get saved, you get all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. Now it's how much of him, you and I is he going to have to control? How much of an ear are you going to give him? How much are you going to listen to him? Because your character, my character, my natural tendencies, and his tendencies are diametrically opposed. I have no interest in forgiving someone who's hurt me, especially when they hurt me real bad. I don't want to give good things to someone who's done wrong to me. 
That goes against my, my grain. When I have money and I have a need, I want to take care of that need first and everyone else can, can get in line. Those are things we ought to understand, but the Spirit of God is going to provoke us to do things that because He knows the mind of God. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Number two, love not only listens to the Holy Spirit and obeys Him, but the love listens to people's names and learns them. You know, I think uh, names are important. I learned this years ago, and I'm still working on it. Some people ask me, you know, John, do you have a photographic memory? And I say, if I do, it's never been developed. <laughs> I know that for sure. No, I don't have a photographic memory. But somewhere, and I do have a mother who is a very big networker. She, she'll talk to you. She'll talk to you until she finds someone that both of you know. Maybe it's in Africa or Asia or uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. But she'll just keep talking to you questions until we find someone that you know that she knows just about. My mother's very, very, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, networking. She's very sociable. And because I moved so much growing up to eight, 17 different places and eight different states growing up, I ever so often had to move and find a new scope of friends, a new neighborhood, a new school, and things of that nature. So it was by, by uh, just the way God let me be raised, I had a new, new group all the time, so I learned names. But somewhere along the line, I realized that names were important to God. If I were writing one book to mankind, I probably wouldn't put as many names as God put in there. And he put some hard names, Onisophorus. <laughs> Aren't you glad your mother didn't name you that? <laughs> Epaphroditus. Some of the other names, I would just rather not say them. I don't even know how to say them. So many of them. But you know why God put names in the Bible? Because God loves people more than anything. He loves you. Of all the Ten Commandments, one of them revolves around the name of Jesus, the name of God. And interesting, people who hate God damn His name. They damn the name of His Son. They oftentimes do that to remind even atheists, people who say, I don't believe in God. They still keep saying His name and damning His name. I kind of wonder, man, why are, you, why are you so excited about it? You don't even believe Him. You keep saying something about something that's not true. You don't even believe him. Well, they know there's a God. He only gets mad and says Buddha and damns his name or Muhammad and damns his name. They damn the name of the God of the Bible and his son. But I thought about names. Names are important. God says, I've exalted my word that above my name, but his name is up there. And your name is important. The Bible tells us there'll be names of people in eternity. I don't know if they'll be the same names we have now. Probably doubt that they will be exactly the same as your mom and dad named you. But their names are important. There's a name written on the forehead of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a name written across the chest. There's different things through the Bible. But names are important. I think the Apostle Paul, he wrote 13 books of the Bible. Over 80 different names are mentioned in his 13 letters. Because names are important. And whenever someone cares enough to learn your name, you think about that. You think, oh, that person cares about me. He loves me. God knows your name, knows how many hairs on your head. He knows about you, what color you like, what your favorite, color, what your favorite ice cream is, what your pleasures, what your dis disdains are. He knows all about that. But he knows your name. He cares about you. And I think oftentimes we need to learn. We, it, love says your name is important to me thinking about that. And I think the more names you learn, the more capacity you can learn. Now, sometimes people say, well, I'm not good at names. And I understand that. That is a difficult thing. But I will say there's a couple things that you can do to help you learn names. Number one, want to learn them. If you just say, I'm just not good at names, then you won't learn any more names. You know your name. <laughs> you thought that was important. But if you want to learn, and when you meet someone, you're trying to learn their name, then you're not going to be perfect. I've certainly not. Lots of people's names I don't know. And some know, know, I know for a while, and then I've, I've lose, I lose them. But I'll give you a couple of thoughts. One is that whenever you meet someone, try to learn their name. Sometimes it happens to me. It may not happen to you, but if I were meeting these three gentlemen, I'd say, Hi, what's your name? Mario. Oh, good. What's your name? Adele. Oh, good. What's your name? Keith. I have no idea what Mario told me. I have no idea because when I was getting to know them, I, I wasn't paying attention. I'm just being friendly. 
Now I don't know any of their names. But something I can do to help me learn his name is by saying, okay, what's your name? Hi, I'm Mario. Mario, nice to meet you. Mario, that is a nice tie. That's great. What's your name? Abdel. Abdel. Boy, that's a unique name. You sound like you're Arabic. <laughs> I've got some friends uh, that are named Abdel. Well, I, now I'm going to, now I'm not only, I've, I've said, okay, I'm going to try to learn Mario's name. I want to, I'm going to listen to his name. I'm going to try to learn his name. Then I'm going to try to learn Abdel's name. But one of the things I can do is I can say their name back to them. Not for their sake. They already know their name. I'm trying to learn it. And the key to, rep the key to learning is oftentimes repetition. You want to remember a joke? Tell a joke. You want to learn something? Repeat it several times over. You don't really learn how to change a tire the first time you change a tire. But the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. I mean, I know how to make business and gravy in a breakfast, but if you keep doing it, you'll be pretty good at it. Learning someone's name, it takes them a little bit of rep repetition. Another thing that, that we find the Apostle Paul did is that he said, making mention of you always in my prayers. I find it's important sometimes to write people's names down. Once again, you and I, I think about Brother Keith's story about a man who came and said, what makes these people so happy? This is such a different environment. I'm not used to this in my home or in my workplace. What is it? But you know, if you learn somebody's name, obviously you're saying they're important to you. So learn their name. And uh, uh, someone who loves to seeks to learn their name, to write their name down, to pray for them. I find when I pray for people, they become subconsciously very important to me. I believe God helps me. And many of you, you may have a list of people you pray for or people that you think about and pray for. Sometimes I'll walk in this auditorium in the early mornings or occasionally in a time where maybe it's not the, the auditorium's not lit up, but I think about the faces of people and where they sit. When some of you guys' jokers move, you really mess me up. <laughs> I think about where they sit and we'll go and think about the families that sit here and the young people sit there and some folks sit here and up in the balcony. And I can remember, sometimes I take pictures of people or have pictures of their families, and I think about them and I pray for them. But it helps me remember their name when we pray for them. Hey, the way we love is we listen to the Holy Spirit and we obey Him. We, we listen to people's names and we seek to learn them. You'll not be perfect, but you can, you can try. And when you do try, uh, it matters to people. I think of several people that now are very faithful servants of Christ. By their own admission, they've told me, Pastor... When I came back the second time and you knew my name, I knew this was my church. I knew I needed to listen because you cared enough about me to learn my name. And, of course, I have failed many times on that. But, you know, not just the pastor needs to know somebody. You can know somebody. Love listens to the Holy Spirit and responds and obeys. Love listens to their names and learns them. Love listens to their hurts and helps them. Philippians chapter 2 is where we are this evening. Look at that if you would, please. Philippians chapter 2, and we see love mentioned here in this passage of Scripture. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. It's a fairly good church, but they do have some issues. If there be, therefore, any consolation or encouragement in the Lord Jesus Christ, if there be any comfort of what? If there be any fellowship of the... There be any bowels and mercies. Bowels and mercies means something that comes from the inside and works out. Your bowels are on the inside. It's, it's just a yearning that starts on the inside. Fulfill you my joy or make my day. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Boy, that's a tough verse to memorize and to, and to put into play, isn't it? He said, let nothing you do be done through strife. The Bible says a servant of God must not strive, but must be gentle with all men, apt to teach, patient. Look, if you would please, the following verse, verse number four, the Bible says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. God made us to be people, and the way we show love and compassion, compassion is just love in action, is by helping other people. You know, the two reasons why you are still on the planet today after you got saved, in my opinion, is number one, 
to give others a good opinion of God, to bring glory to God, to be a mirror. Let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and then glorify your Father which is in heaven. I don't know if your life is doing that, but that's what my life should be doing. That's what your life should be doing. It should be giving others a good opinion of the God that you said that uh, you've accepted and he accepted you. And it should be a good test. That's why we should, we should pay our bills on time. That's why if we don't have the money to pay our bills, we should contact our creditor and say, we've got some issues here. Would you work with me? That's why you should, someone gives you too much money after a, 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 at, at McDonald's and they give you an extra dollars or they make a mistake there. You should turn around and go back and say, you know what, you, you over uh, gave me too much change. This is back to you. Not say, well, too bad for them, good for me. Because you're a servant of God. You're reflecting the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not just reflecting you. But secondly, not only to bring glory to God, but bring good to others. Twofold purpose of living. Honoring God, helping other people. There's a song that goes, help somebody today, somebody along life's way. Let heartaches be ended, the friendless be friendless. Friended, oh, help somebody today. Everybody ought to be finding someone that you can help. And love goes out of her way to say, what can I do to be a blessing to someone else for Christ's sake? The blessings are innumerable. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord watch if someone even gives a cup of cold water in his name, he says, oh, that, that guy's got a reward. Giving and serving and ministering to people, really, I, I get tired of this and you get tired of it. Because anytime you open your arms up to love someone, you leave your heart exposed and you're going to get nailed. Some folks say, you know, I just don't want to love again. I don't want to make myself vulnerable. I've got a guarded heart. You'll never do what God wants you to do with that mentality. You, you make yourself vulnerable, you are going to get nailed. Look at our Lord Jesus. How did he die? Like this. The broken heart that was wounded for our transgressions. And yet the Bible teaches us that if we're going to be the Christians God wants to be, we need to go outside of our comfort zone. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on your things of others. We're very self-centered. We're very looking about what's good for us, what we need, what we want. How is this going to affect my finances, my house, my car, my possessions? I've oftentimes, I've driven down the road and I see someone that needs a ride. And sometimes I can help them. And sometimes I say, you know, I don't think I want to put them in my car. And the truth of the matter is, the reason is because I think it's my car. And I forget whose car it really is. I forget who is talking to me and telling me to help somebody. And you can't help everybody. We understand that's true. But we can help people. Brother Hiles used that wonderful poem on uh, others. Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer should be for others. Others, Lord. Yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live more like thee. And help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true. And know that all I need must be do, must be, need be done for others. Let self be crucified and slain. And buried deep and all in vain may efforts be to rise again unless to live for others. What is love? Love is listening. It is listening to the Holy Spirit and doing what he asks you to do. It's learning someone's name and, and, and listening to their name and learning it. It is looking for someone who is hurting and helping them. Sometimes I don't want to ask people how they're doing. They might tell me. And then I'm going to feel like i got to do something about it. That's expensive. Love is a very costly thing. And yet, it's what, it is what God called us to do. He wants us to listen to the hurts of others and, and seek, what can I do to be a help in that? I find the greatest Christians I've ever met are people who are sensitive to the needs of others. Let's look at another passage of Scripture. Would you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 14? We need a revival of care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says, Now we exhort you, brethren... Warn them of their unruly. So if someone's out of, out of control or out of, out of line, he said, give them a warning. But I want you to read the rest of it with me. Not only should we give them a warning unruly, but we should comfort the feeble-minded. 
Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Those are things God asks us to do, and basically that sounds like tough. It's difficult. At the same time, God tells us, if we're going to love, we need to listen. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to their names and learn them. Listen to their hurts and seek to help them. There's a world that needs help. Brother Hiles would say on his radio broadcast, be good to everybody, because everybody's having a tough day. The truth of the matter is, you on, and me on our toughest day is nothing compared to what, what people are going through and what people will go through if we don't help them. We oftentimes find ourselves complaining and frustrated, aggravated at how things are going for us. We need to really turn our, our attention and say, Lord, teach me to love. Help me to be a good listener. Listen to your Holy Spirit. Listen to names and caring about people. Listen to their hurts and helping them with your Holy Spirit's help. Let's bow in prayer, can we please? I'm going to say, Pastor, I, I think I see some areas of my life I've got to, to make adjustments. Be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. You would say with me, Pastor, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Would you raise your hand with me this evening? Me too. When you think about love and how valuable, how needed it is, how it could be such a game changer in our church, in your home, at your school, at your work. Let's let the God help us with that. Maybe there's someone here you're not sure if you died today you'd go to heaven. I want to encourage you to come to the Lord and let someone take the Bible and show you how to be saved. The best day of my life was a Sunday night after I heard the message of the gospel and I did not know if I died to go to heaven but someone took the time to show me from the Bible how I could be saved. If you're here like that, would you let someone help you with that? I'd appreciate that. Would you look this way, if you would, please, church family? Look this way, if you would. We're going to take an invitation in a moment. I'm going to need to slip out. But I'd like to just say uh, to you, before we respond to the Lord, how much I appreciate every one of you for serving Christ as you do. And of course, five years ago, tonight I knelt over here and around many of you who prayed with us and welcomed us. We brought our family up on there. Back then, Lacey was two years old. Now she's seven. And Derek was with us. And lots, of, uh, lots of fears and difficult times that we were facing and experiencing together. And I want to just say to you, thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for staying on your bus route in your Sunday school class. Thank you for believing in the Lord when it was kind of hard to do that. We've We've weathered lots of trials in just uh, five years and a lot of things and a lot of naysayers and many people have taken exits off the high road of holiness and others have joined us who weren't even saved five years ago and now are very vital parts of our ministry. Over 3,000 people have gone through discipleship at one level or another. Lots of sweet things have happened. Lots of new faces in the choir and ushers and lots of new bus drivers and bus workers and all those young people over at the college, most of them were not here five years ago, and God's brought them. I was thinking yesterday as I, we assembled for our Super Saturday Soul Winning, how thankful I am for hundreds of people that would come out on a Saturday. I pulled away and saw Brother John Carlo leading the ladies of the Lord or talking to someone at the Gospel of Christ yesterday as I was going to make my visit and tell someone about Christ. I just want you to know I love you and I appreciate you. I want to thank you for your faithfulness to Christ. And I want to encourage you. Let's learn to love. When people come to this church, they ought to know three things. Number one, those people love Jesus. They hear what Jesus says from his word. And I feel the love of Jesus when I'm there. And they should not only feel that when this, in the walls of this building, they should feel it in your neighborhood, at your work, wherever we go. Let's ask the Lord to help us. I do believe if we'll deepen our love for Christ, we'll raise our seal and a commitment to him to do other things for great exploits. We only have a sh few short years to live. So like every week we talk about some of our members who are going home to be with the Lord. And as long as we have this many people, that'll be happening all the time. And one day it might be my casket, it might be your casket, your... You know, but I, whenever you stand before God, whether it be by the rapture or by, be by, by death, I hope that you and I will have served God with fervency. May we be known as a people that love Jesus Christ. I love you and appreciate you. Let's stand together.